Today, I'm going to walk you through how to build a collection of random, generative characters using the new version of my add-on, FZ Randomizer 3.0. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to anybody who has supported this add-on, whether it was through donations, or beta testing groups, or general feedback here on YouTube comments, or over on Twitter or Instagram. I had a lot of fun making this add-on. But this project would not be what it is today without the community's support from you, so thank you. Some of the new features that were included in the 3.0 release are the Host Builder panel, Rules, the JSON Metadata Builder, the Geometry Nodes interface, support for animated variants, and a Render Output panel, as well as multiple bug fixes and optimizations for speed and efficiency. It's worth being noted that this plugin is only compatible with Blender 3.1 or later. That being said, let's jump in and start making some generative characters. If you're familiar with older versions of FC Randomizer, you'll recognize that a major change is that we've moved the whole add-on into the viewport. Today's example file will be these little gumball characters. I don't know, I thought it would be cool to have like characters made of gumball machines or something. I don't know, don't think about it too much. The first new feature of the 3.0 version is the host builder panel. When starting with FZ Randomizer, you want to define a host collection. This is going to be the collection that hosts the entire randomization process. For my project, I'm creating gumball characters, so I'll name my host collection gumballs. Subcollections are essentially the categories of your characters, or the attributes at large. These categories might include a grouping of shirts that could be randomly selected, maybe a grouping of shoes or glasses, or anything you can choose that would be a group of objects to be randomly selected in that category. My gumball characters are going to consist of five subcollections, the body, the gumball, which is essentially the head of the character, the face, which is essentially the expression, a background, and a hat. And once I've set up my subcollections properly, I can go ahead and click build. You'll see what it did was just set up a collection structure in the outliner, which is the host collection, as well as five subcollections, each one representing the proper attribute category. The host builder also reflects the host name back into the main panel of the randomizer. But it's worth being noted that you don't have to use the host builder. These first steps can be done manually. In fact, even the host name in the main randomizer panel can be manually entered as well. All that matters is the host name matches the host collection you'd like to randomize. Okay, let's start bringing in some of these objects into their proper subcollection, or you know, their respective category. I have a black shirt here, which really just kind of looks like a, like a little bean or something. But I have a black shirt. I have this inner tube body. I have a jetpack, I have a shirt called the 90s, which you get it, and I have a body type called waiter. You'll notice some of these objects here in the body collection actually have a different icon. They have this little collection icon, whereas two of the other ones have the mesh icon. And what's up with that? Well, these are what I call complex objects. A complex object is any object that is made up of multiple objects. Think of this as an attribute that's made up of two or more actual objects that you just want to be treated as one object. Well, there's actually a really simple way to handle this. Anytime I have a complex object, I create an assets collection, which is outside of the host collection, sort of just living on its own. And within the assets collection, I make a new collection dedicated to that complex object. In this case, here's the waiter. You can see how it's actually made up of three different objects, but it's all inside of this one waiter collection. It's as easy as hitting shift A and then navigating the whole way to the bottom of that menu to where you find collection instance. Here, I can search for waiter or whatever complex object that is created in the assets folder. This is now treated as one object and I can put this back into the respective sub collection that it belongs in. And I simply follow the same process for the jetpack and the inner tube body and any other complex object in this entire collection. I'm now just going to go ahead and drag all of my pre-made body assets into the body subcollection. Remember, these are only attributes of the body, so nothing else should go inside of this collection. And I'll just follow the same steps for the gumball subcollection, the face subcollection, background, and the hat. So now we should have a completed host collection structure. And just like that, we're ready to start generating variants. The first decision you'll need to make is do I want unique characters? No one character variation will be composed of the same trait combination as any other variation that already came first. Each new variation will have a unique combination of attributes. I'll click that and then I'll click Calculate Possibilities. Because we're looking for unique variations, 
there can only be a finite number of actually unique combinations. This number is easily found by multiplying the number of attributes from each category together. The more attributes you have, the more possibilities for unique characters you have. In other words, don't be lazy with this. Make sure you actually have enough possibilities to make unique looking characters. So if you're familiar with the previous FC randomizer videos, then you might be familiar with this term I created called proxy swap. This is basically just the engine that the generator uses. In previous versions, I used a different engine and basically it was just very resource intensive and also just took a long time to create all of the variants because it was actually generating object data. I'm not gonna get into exactly how it works, but the point is proxy swap is the way to go. In fact, there's multiple tools from the first few versions of FC Randomizer that aren't the standard anymore. I didn't want to just get rid of any of these old tools, so I built a legacy tools panel that's just included at the very bottom. Any of the old tools that maybe aren't the standard anymore, such as link mat groups and shape key tools and spawn tools, they're all still there. Okay, everything's set up properly. We have our host collection defined on the right. Looks like I'm going to generate 10 unique variants, and it's as easy as hitting generate. And that quickly, it's already done. As you can see, what we're given here is a proxy object, a geometry nodes proxy. This is just one object collectively, and it is driven by a geometry nodes stack. If we pull it up here, we can go to geometry nodes and we'll see we have FZ randomizer as a geometry nodes stack. Right out of the box, it works just like it did before. You can use the timeline and the arrow keys to jump between the variants that it generated. In my case, I only generated 10, so I can only move 10 spaces. Taking a look at the geometry nodes interface now, the first thing I'll do is I'll turn off the use generation slider. This allows us to build out the actual combinations that we defined using geometry nodes and using clicking sliders. This just makes it very easy to play around and experiment, maybe do some research and development, figure out what goes well together, what doesn't go well together, just build out some variants. And when you're done, you can always go back and use the generation from what we already generated in the panel. Another new feature that's only available in 3.0 is the support of animated variants. If I switch the still animated slider over to one, I can then use the variant slider to control which variant we're looking at. This frees up the timeline to then be used as intended as an actual animated sequence timeline. So any animation data that's present in the file, whether it's in the form of an armature or it's in the form of just regular keyframe data, can be rendered for each variant. And we'll go over rendering later because you have a couple options there now. Rarity. So Rarity works like a lottery system. Now I'm gonna go over this, but I will say I already covered Rarity in great detail in the 2.1 version video. So if you're still looking for a little more help grasping the concept of how the Rarity system works, it might be worth it to go back and check out that video as well. The Rarity system works like a lottery. Inside the body collection, there are five objects. And think of those five objects like five people participating in a lottery. Each one gets one ticket. So the ticket pool consists of five tickets and we can draw one of those random five tickets and that one is the one selected. But if you want better chances of winning a lottery, it's helpful to get more tickets. So we can assign more tickets to specific objects, increasing their chances of being selected. This object's rarity is a one in five chance of being selected or 20% chance. Now, imagine this black t-shirt is a more common object. We can give this a better chance of being selected because it's more common, it's more likely to be selected. And that's as easy as just increasing the ticket count for this one object. As you can see, as we increase the ticket count here, we get more tickets for this object, but more importantly, we get more tickets in the entire ticket pool for specifically the body sub collection. Now, obviously this increases the odds of this object being selected, but on the flip side, it decreases the odds of all the other objects to be selected. For example, if we select this inner tube body, which reminder lives in the same sub collection as the black t-shirt does, you can see that because we added more tickets to the black t-shirt, our chances for the inner tube body went from one in five chance or a 20% chance to now a one in 14 chance or a 7% chance. So this rarity system is all about balance. It's like an equation. When you change one side of the formula, the other side is affected equally. So part of the fun of all of this is the artistic freedom to experiment with rarity. Generate some variants, experiment in the geometry nodes interface, then just delete your variants, make any necessary changes in the host collection, and regenerate. To piggyback off that experimentation, imagine that I'm playing around with the geometry nodes interface and I find that the waiter body looks particularly spectacular when paired with the gold gumball. So I decide anytime we generate the waiter body selection, I think it should be paired with a gold gumball. So how do we make that happen? 
In the 3.0 version, another new feature that is brought to the table is the introduction of rules. Rules allow you to place strict parameters on your generation process. This determines whether objects are or are not compatible together. As a matter of fact, there's only two rules that you can assign. It's always or never. Before we set this rule, it's important to recognize that every single generation that's randomly assigned truly is randomly assigned, which means these rules don't change anything about the generation. This does not change the gumball to be gold. This simply just asks the question, is the gumball gold? And if it's not gold, then it deems the entire variation as a failure. It gets rid of this entire variation, then it re-rolls the dice, looking for a variation that passes all of the rules. The reason this is important to know is because this can actually affect the rarity of your object. Think of it like this. If an attribute is already difficult to be selected because it's so rare, then adding rules on top of that just act as one extra loophole for it to get through. Because at the end of the day, this is still a random generator. Nothing is being changed. Everything is generated randomly. Rules are specific to each object. Some objects will have no rules, and some objects may have a lot of rules. It all depends on what you decide to set. In this case, we decided that the waiter should always be with the gumball. So I'll set a new rule for the waiter object. First, I'll select the gold gumball, and I will define that it will always be selected, meaning that this is always the option. As you can see, this warning appears, which is again just a reminder that using rules like this can actually affect the rarity. Another thing to keep in mind is that, again, this rule is associated with the waiter. It's not associated with the gold gumball. Anytime you see a waiter, you will see a gold gumball. That does not mean anytime you see a gold gumball, you will always see a waiter. So I'm gonna give this gold gumball a couple more tickets. I really want this to, to definitely be selected. I don't want this to be very rare in this case. When I hit generate, as we cycle through, we're gonna see, okay, there's one. Uh, I'm gonna keep going, there's another. Keep going. We have another and another even. The waiter and gold gumball combo is actually coming up more than I ever could have expected. This just tells me I need to decrease the odds here because I'm feeling like it's coming up too much now. Okay, so that's a basic overview of what rules do. Let's take a look at how metadata has been introduced into this new version. So I'm gonna bring up my root folder here, the working folder of this project. And something to keep in mind is that all of your metadata will be generated into this folder. So make sure you actually save and you have an active directory. With right to CSV checked, and I have my CSV file name listed there with a .csv extension, I can hit generate again. And if we go back to our active directory, we can now see that we've generated a CSV document which contains all of the attributes. This is a very straightforward variant one through X of how many you generated, and it includes every single attribute for every single variant. So I'm going to uncheck write to CSV, and I'm going to re-enable write to JSON. Now it looks a little bare bones at first, but this gives you the option to build out a JSON document from scratch. Now, if I just hit generate, and we go back to our root directory, we will see a metadata folder has appeared. Hmm, interesting. If I go into it, okay, we have 10 documents, but there's nothing in them. They're just curly braces. Well, this actually makes sense. This is because we gave no data. We gave no information to the JSON generator. So we have to give it some information. Let's start with a description. My description for these characters is gonna be 10 of the coolest gumballs. So now if I regenerate our characters and we go back to the root directory, go back to the metadata, we can see that we have 10 JSON documents that each include a description. Perfect, we're getting somewhere. Let's add some more fields. I'm going to add a name and the name will be gumball number. And here's where we can use what I call an incremental variable. The incremental variable by default is underscore underscore capital VAR. And what that does is anytime it references the number of this variant, it will replace that incremental variable with the actual number in the metadata. Here I type underscore underscore VAR, then I will regenerate the characters and go back to the metadata. You'll see now that as I open a couple of these JSON documents, each one has replaced the incremental variable with the respective variant index. And this can be used anywhere in the metadata generator. For example, I'll add another field to the metadata called image. This is where I'll define exactly where this image is going to be stored online. 
Again, I'll include this incremental variable, except this time I'm going to follow it up with a .png file extension. Even though it's in between all these characters, it will still be able to find this incremental variable and replace that anywhere in the metadata. This way our JSON documents include the proper index throughout the entirety of the JSON files. So now it's time to link in the attributes to our JSON documents, otherwise, what point does this serve, right? Well, it's literally as simple as adding a field called attributes and hitting that little plus button. You'll notice the attributes were actually linked in a little bit differently than the other fields. That's because attributes is actually a keyword recognized by the JSON builder. Linking in your attributes field to the metadata builder will actually allow you to recall all of the attributes into the JSON document, similar to how you did with the CSV, except this time it's stored as an array inside of a JSON document. The metadata builder also has some really cool advanced features like custom attributes, property groups, and custom display types but I won't cover all of that in this video. All right, we did it. We built out the coolest collection and now it's time to render these out. You can open up the file directory output and we can select a folder to put these renders into. What I do is make a renders folder and then inside the renders folder, I make another folder called render one because oftentimes you have multiple renders to deal with anyway. I don't ever put a name after that folder because FZ Randomizer already takes care of the naming and the file extension. The next step you have to do is configure your output. In this case, I'm configuring it for still images, so I'll just click that button. And then it's as simple as hitting render variants. Now, before I do that, the first thing I like to do is go to window and open up toggle system console. This is a very helpful readout for whenever you're doing anything with FC Randomizer. I usually just like to put my console off to the right here, so I have a visual readout of what's going on. As a matter of fact, imagine we have to generate 1500 variants here. When I'm running a large task like this, Blender might look like it's frozen or it's about to crash, but in reality, it's just running a very large task in the background. Having the console open on the right hand side is a very good indicator of what's actually going on behind the scenes. So this way, when I hit render variants, we can actually see each variant being rendered frame by frame. You can also just open your root directory and watch the frames populate into the render folder as they finish. The same workflow can be done for animated variants. I'll configure it for animation by clicking the button and then I'll make a new render folder, call this render2. Now we have a place to put these renders. I'll just hit accept with no file name and I will click render variants. Like we saw before, Blender is rendering frame by frame, except in this case, it will render each frame of the full timeline for every single variant. Now this can run for a very long time, so it's very helpful to save before you run the render. If we check on our renders here in the root directory, we can see our MP4 files populating in nicely as they finish. FZ Randomizer 3.0 is now available on Gumroad as a free download. If you'd like to support the development of this add-on, as well as other future projects on my channel, leaving a donation here of any kind is incredibly appreciated. Seriously, I can't thank you enough. If you want to support the channel and projects in other ways, just simply subscribing and watching my videos is a great way to support the channel and future projects for the community. So go pick up FZ Randomizer 3.0 over on Gumroad today and start making something cool for yourself. Until next time.